What is up? What is up? Uh, Dustin Fowler here. We're going to talk about some geopolitics. Uh, the title of this um, particular review says Political Geography Review. But in looking at what we've covered and looking at the course articulation, there was a few things I noticed that I really need to spend some time on specifically. So what I'm going to do is, uh, if you guys have any questions about anything, feel free to ask. I mean, ask away. But I'm going to focus mainly on state morphology, which is going to include um, uh, boundaries and gerrymandering. And then we're going to spend a little bit of time at the end looking at geopolitical models, which is something that I mentioned earlier that I was going to spend a little bit of time on this week. So ready, set, go. <clears throat> Hope you guys have all had a great week. One thing I wanted to show you, there's my um, social media. I still haven't taken that out, uh, but it's there. It's been on the last few presentations. But um, I wanted you guys to know that the uh, fiveable live streams <clears throat> are going to are going to be free from now on. So, uh, and you guys, a lot of you probably know this because a lot of you are probably on here uh, uh, free right now. If you want to get access to recordings, then go in and and take the time to to become a member. Um, it's very comparable in price to something like a review manual or um, something else you would get to help you prepare for the AP exam. And if it's helpful to you, make sure that your friends know so that they can get in on it as well. Uh, also, just know that in April, you know, it really gets to be crunch time because your AP exam is going to be a second week in May. So there are your objectives. We're going to jump right into it because I feel like this one's going to go, like I'm probably going to take this one all the way to 8 o'clock or just, just before that. So. Um, so morphology, when we talk about, Hey, what is up? Are uh, my captions, uh, are they catching what I'm trying to say? Or are they just, uh, God only knows what they're going to, what they're going to hear me say and, and, and what pops up in those captions. But, uh, yeah, they're kind of fancy, aren't they? Um, hi, Tasha. Morphology. When we look at morphology of anything. Okay. Yeah. Drop my, drop my mic. Literally. Let me try that again. Put it right over here. All right. When we look at morphology, looking at the study of the forms of things. <laughs> um, so the shape of something. When we talk about state morphology, we're looking quite literally at the shapes that states are going to take. Uh, if you look at a political map of the United States, you'll see the, the shapes of the individual states of the Union. Look at a political map of Europe, you'll see the shapes of states. A lot of those are going to be compact. Um, we're going to talk about it. So state morphology is the shapes of states, simply put. Um, and, and honestly, this is something that a lot of you probably covered earlier in the unit. Uh, if you have been in political geography, geography for a little while, you've probably already looked at this. Um, it's, it's always good to come back and look at it again. It is in the course to articulation, so you, you are going to see this on the AP exam. Um, why do states look like they do, and what does that have to do with anything? All right. Well, it's going to have the, it's going to break down, or it's, or it's I guess part of the reason why they look. Uh, like they do, uh, it, it has to do with the spatial perspective, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But um, these are here are some of the factors that play into that. Okay, you've got uh, centripetal and centrifugal forces. Uh, that's that's going to be a part of it. Maybe uh, your state shape is going to have to do with, um, or it could be a symbol of unity or identity. Like for example, if you look at a picture of the United States on a shirt, uh, that's something that we all can kind of rally behind, right? Um, determines or the shape of states determines how countries interact with one another and how they communicate with the borders. In particular, certain shapes more so than others. Here's that picture of the U.S. I was just telling you. We put this on a shirt. It's a symbol of national pride. Um, every geography class in the world has one of these on the back of the wall, right? Um, you can also see that that Indonesia here. Well, what's going on with that? You've got one island right here, one island right here. You, the island of Java, and then these little tiny islands and all these other. That right there is an example of a centrifugal force. All right, so let me go, let me go back right here. I want, I want to go over these two terms. Um, when we talk about a centripetal force, you're looking at things that pull something together. So those of you who are science scholars, a uh, centripetal force is going to be a force that prevents something from going out. All right, If I take my lanyard and I twist it around, the, the centripetal forces are keeping the – end of the lanyard from flying away. <clears throat> so in that same way, a centripetal force when it comes to nationalism is something that goes group of people. Yeah. 
a centrifugal force is going to do the opposite of that. It's going to be something that fragments a group of people based on their individual differences. So if you look at Indonesia, and you can see that the shape of this state, which is all over the place, it's fragmented, uh, that's going to be a centrifugal force, something that's going to separate people geographically in that area, even culturally. So the five basic shapes that's in every, every, uh, um, that's in every uh, geography book, the Rubenstein book, all of them you're going to look at, any other review manuals are these five basic st uh, states right here. The compact, prorupt, uh, fragmented, elongated, perforated. All right, so let's break it down. Hi, everyone from uh, Harlan. Shout out to Harlan. Woo! Um, state morphology. These, these right here are, uh, or I think I missed one in there. Nope. Where are my slides? Uh, well, there's supposed to be, maybe somewhere in there, there's going to be a slide on, on um, compact states because uh, I definitely made one. I'm not sure what happened to it. But um, what we're looking at here are different examples of a compact state. Now, when something is compacted, if you take aluminum foil and you wad it up in a big ball, it becomes compacted, right? It's basically round like a ball, all right? So in the same way, compact states are usually going to be mostly round. Now, look, Rwanda is not round like a ball, but it's mostly round with the capital in the center. Zimbabwe, mostly round with the capital in the center. Poland, same thing. Uh, here's what Poland looks like on a map of Europe. And France, mostly compact with Paris more or less in the middle of, 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 the, of the pack. Now, so when you look at compact states, there are several advantages that come with that, both political advantages, cultural, you name it. If a group of people is, are, are easily accessible by the government, they can have access to things like resources. Um, things like the economy can be more accessible to everyone. Uh, they might have more representation in government because the government is in the center of everyone and kind of represents the state as a whole. These are all things that characterize the compact states. All right. So really, if there is one probably best all around picture state, usually you think about compact and everything's kind of where it needs to be. Usually compact states are relatively small. And these are all relatively smallish. Uh, countries. Maybe France and Poland live on the large, on the, I guess on the medium side, if you look at the world as a whole. A prorupted state is going to have all those same advantages that we just talked about with the accessibility to resources, the representation from the government, um, the, the, the fact that people are close by in case of emergency. All these different things are going to pertain to the prorupted state, except the prorupted state also has a prorruption or a piece of land sticking out of it. All right. So, What's the purpose of that piece of land? It definitely serves a purpose, all right? Um, and you can have economic purposes as well as political purposes to the shape of a prorupted state, all right? So one of the economic examples is the Democratic Republic of Congo. A political example would be Afghanistan. Afghanistan is the probably the best of those two examples, India as well. And, and here's what I mean, okay? If you look at, these are examples of prorupted states. This is Afghanistan. Look at that right there. That little offshoot there. That's a prorruption. All right. Um, India is actually kind of, you know, surrounds Bangladesh. Uh, we, we forget sometimes this part over here on the east is part of India. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Notice this little prorruption right here that gives it a little bit of access to the coast. Now, it's easy to see why that's there. Um, when the, uh, the, the, the Dutch were in here uh, conquering, I'm sorry, Belgium was in here conquering this area during the age of imperialism, they wanted access to, to, the, uh, to the ocean, okay? So that's the purpose of that, it's economic. And then you've got Thailand, which kind of juts down this way, a corruption, okay? So let's look right here, particularly at this one. We're going to revisit this later on as well. But <clears throat> if you look at a map of Cold War geopolitics, you would notice that this here is one of the uh, Shatter Belt regions during that, during that time period. We're gonna, uh, Shatter Belt is, is simply an area... Uh, that is kind of like the in-between zone between two conflicting powers. We're going to look at several examples of Shire Belt. If you didn't write down Shire Belt, I would take the time to do that because you're definitely going to see on the test. Um, and what you had is the Soviets to the north and the, uh, you know, the, the, the West was trying to, to defend this area down you know, you know, in India or around India, Pakistan. And so this actually became a buffer zone 
That's another one you need to know what, what it is. A buffer zone, a small little region between conflicting areas um, that separate the two groups. All right, so that, there's what that is. Uh, if you look at the, I don't know if you guys are familiar with uh, Geography Now, the YouTube channel, but if you watch the Afghanistan Geography Now, he talks a little bit about that. Um, those are really good videos, by the way. Um, number three, the uh, elongated state. Okay, so now we're finally starting to look at something a little bit different from that basic compact round uh, state morphology. The elongated states, uh, these are here can have some certain some certain problems associated with them. One, they in the in the case of Chile, which is the textbook example. Okay, uh, you've got possibly the the span of many climate zones. All right, so Chile, you literally will have some areas that are always warm, some areas that are always cold. Uh, you've got a lot of climate areas that are kind of within that latitude span. You also have varying terrain. If you're going to be long and skinny, more or less, you're going to cover a lots of different types of terrain, maybe some desert here, maybe some mountains there. So if you look at Chile, this along the Andes Mountains, some of the highest mountains in the, uh, you know, in the, in the world, definitely in the Western Hemisphere. Um, the capital city is going to be somewhere in the state. It might be in the north. It might be in the south. It might be in the dead center. But there's going to be people along that elongated state that don't have a whole lot of access to the capital and might be cut off from, from the uh, government administration. It might be difficult to get resources from one place to another in the event that there is an emergency or in, during just you know regular day-to-day. -day. Maybe economically this might be a problem for that country or for an elongated state. Um, we just said difficulty during emergencies. They may also lack <clears throat> certain natural resources. Now, if you look at the United States, a great big country with tons of resources and everything, uh, it covers a large varying degree of, of different types of land. Well, Chile, like I said, is mostly along the mountains. That might limit it in its, in its capacity to have certain resources that other countries may, uh, may have a, as a surplus. So, those are all some things that could apply to most elongated states, perhaps. Here are some examples of the elongated states. This is here is obviously the best example, the one that is probably everyone's go-to, Chile. Uh, you might could even consider Argentina to be elongated. I, mean, I, I do. I think that's elongated. It's not like super skinny like Chile, but it's, it's pretty long. Um, you've got the Scandinavian countries. Okay, so, so Norway, Sweden, and Finland are in what we call Scandinavia. The Scandinavian Peninsula is going to be this region right here. All three of those are going to be elongated. And then you've got small states like uh, Malawi that is also elongated. And there are others as well. You could, you could spend some time Googling them and find maybe a few more. <clears throat> um, fragmented states, the fourth of the five different types of states we're looking at. So, so far, we've looked at the compact. And we talked about how everything's kind of centered around the capital. We looked at pro-erupted, which is kind of like compact, except with this little pro-eruption jig off. We looked at elongated. Now we're on number four, fragmented. All right, so a fragmented state is like our friend Indonesia that we just now saw. It's going to be fragmented because it's going to be consisting of a bunch of islands. Now, wait a second. Does it have to be an archipelago in order to be fragmented? The answer to that question is no, because Russia is not an archipelago. The United States is not an archipelago. Philippines are an, an archipelago. What's an archipelago, guys? Y'all are familiar with that term, right? So we're looking at a group of islands. So Indonesia and Philippines are a group of islands. Uh, Denmark has a bunch of islands in there. It would also, uh, it wouldn't be an archipelago, but it would definitely be fragmented. So the problems that you may see when you are living in a fragmented state is that it's difficult to manage sometimes. You got you got to either travel by plane or boat just to get from one place to another if you want to represent more than just an island or two. So this could lead to political fragmentation, which also could have maybe different cultures represented in certain areas and, and be concentrated that might be somewhat of a centrifugal force. Um, cultural hardships due to isolation. Some places may be better off than others. Um, difficult uh, to get information and resources, kind of like with the elongated state, maybe even harder with a, with a um, fragmented. Um, difficult to travel within the country, obviously, right? And then here are some examples. Now, let's look at these. So I've got Denmark here. Denmark is in uh, northern Europe. So if you look back at our map of Europe from earlier, uh, Denmark is right here where the cursor is. Uh, relatively small. All right, so going back. Uh, Denmark is a fragmented state. Um, Russia 
this here is Colin Kaliningrad. Excuse me. Uh, it is not connected to the rest of Russia. Russia is a fragmented state. You could argue. On the United States, you've got Hawaii and Alaska that are you know not connected to the 48 contiguous states. So the United States would be an example of a fragmented state. Canada would be an example of a fragmented state, um, uh, and and many others. Now, this one right here for my students, this was always the most complicated. I guess everything else kind of speaks for itself. Pretty easy to understand, but perforated states. This is here threw my students off a lot. Let's see if y'all understand. When you look at a perforated state, it's one that totally surrounds another state. So in this picture, what is the perforated state? It's not actually labeled. Oh, yeah, it is. I'm sorry. <laughs> Duh. Here I am getting confused myself. This, this here is Lesotho. Is it perforated or is it compact? You see what I mean? So Lesotho is completely surrounded by South Africa. South Africa is the perforated state. A perforation, y'all, is a hole in something. My daughter had a perforated eardrum from getting um, tubes. She had to have surgery to get the perforation or the hole repaired. And so if you look at South Africa without Lesotho, there's a literally a big political hole right here in it. That's the perforation. All right. So South Africa is a perforated state. Y'all, uh, Lesotho is compact, obviously. It's perfectly round. Okay. Now, the reason why this is like this is it goes back to apartheid. I don't know if you y'all surely y'all have studied apartheid at this part at this point of, of the course, but uh, and we talked about it a little bit several weeks ago, but apartheid is is kind of like U.S. segregation, uh, you know, this here was mostly a concentration of blacks in a in a um, area that was a minority white, but whites dominated. And so, um, this is, even today, Lesotho is predominantly black, but it's a country that kind of exists within South Africa with its legacy of an apartheid. Okay, so uh, perforated states totally surround another state. We already established that. <clears throat> Surrounded states have conflicts with states surrounding them, okay? So if you look at this, the, the state that's going to have the hardest trouble with this arrangement is going to be Lesotho because they are at the mercy of South Africa to even get to the coast. Well, if South Africa has a problem with Lesotho and wants to cause problems for them or prevent people from being able to pass onto the coast and they can't get goods in, they can't get goods out, that would suck. So surrounding states have a lot of um, power I'm sorry, states surrounding the state, like Lesotho, has a lot of power over them. The economy de depends on relations with the surrounding countries, all right? And also, countries like that are landlocked. Well, it's, well that's another important thing we got to talk about having to do with, uh, it's, it's not really, landlocked isn't a shape, but landlocked is a status that's really important because if, if a country doesn't have access to the ocean, they are at a huge economic disadvantage against countries that do. I, I can't believe it. I forgot to put up a map of Africa. It shows this massive stretch of countries right in the center of Africa that are completely landlocked. There are landlocked countries in other places as well, like Afghanistan is a landlocked country. By the way, Afghanistan is also the poorest country in all of Asia. Uh, South Africa and Italy are the only probably two perforated states on Earth. Uh, if there's another one, I, I don't know what it is off the top of my head. I, I, I think that these are the only ones. These are the only ones I know of. Um, South Africa has Lesotho in it. Italy has Vatican City and San Marino completely within its its boundary. And, and Vatican City, that right there's where the Pope lives. The Pope is like the the head of that state. It is a state that uh, is kind of the headquarters of the the Roman Catholic Church. It, it's not. It's very big. It's, it's the smallest state, smallest sovereign state on earth. And San Marino is basically a city state or one of those micro states we talked about a couple of weeks ago. Um, so another thing that I wanted to talk about is this idea of these, these vocab terms, enclaves and exclaves. All right, so I've got both these words listed side by side. And, and, uh, and, and I, I mentioned here that Kaliningrad is an example of an exclave of Russia. All right, Lesotho and San Marino are enclaves. All right, so let's look real quick back at Russia. Here it is. That right there is an exclave of Russia. When you look at the, 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 the prefix ex, right? we're talking about x something, um, 
an exclave in this case is something that's going to be on the exterior, on the outside of the of the of the state. All right. So Russia is not connected to this. This is on the outside, and yet it's still part of Russia. It's going to be an exclave. Now, when we look at enclaves, something that's completely surrounded by something else might be an enclave. Think back to ethnic geography. Uh, in back in chapter, if you like, if you're using the Rubenstein book, just covered in chapter seven, you're talking about ethnic enclaves or ethnic neighborhoods. Sometimes you'll see it called. That would be an example of something like a Jewish block or a Chinatown, completely surrounded by everything else uh, like within the city. That would be an enclave, right? In the same way, Lesotho and San Marino are completely surrounded by Italy. They are enclaves. They are political enclaves. So what is the difference between these two? Because sometimes you might, see, you might hear people talk about Kaliningrad as an enclave or, or, or whatever. I would say that the context is the main thing, but ultimately... Ultimately, it really doesn't matter. And I really, I really don't think it matters if you differentiate between the two. And I'll tell you why. Well, first, look at the definitions of the two. An enclave is a portion of territory within a surrounded, within or surrounded by a larger territory whose inhabitants are culturally or ethnically distinct. And then an, an exclave, a portion of territory of one state, like Kaliningrad, is a portion of Russia that is completely surrounded by territory of another as viewed by one home territory. That's the only difference between the two, all right? So ultimately, wow, that, that's, there's my slide. It's out of order. Ultimately, the reason why I would say it doesn't matter is because you don't want to get wrapped up in the, in the minute details having to do with the definition of a word when it's all about the spatial perspective, dude, all right? In other words, the where of why, the where of why. Let me see. I got a question up in here. Do landlocked states have any benefits security-wise? I would always think about – now, first of all, I don't think that in, in 2019, I don't think that a landlocked state necessarily has to be screwed over because of its being landlocked, but being landlocked is never going to be a good thing for a state. All right, So um, I think that if a landlocked state has decent security, it would always be better if the state had access to the ocean. It, it, you know, it just would because if if there's ever a conflict with a state that's surrounding or with one of the neighboring states, they could cause problems and strain and economic issues dealing with with that with that state, which is a security issue. So I, I would say that um, do landlocked states have any benefits security wise? No, not really. Not over something this guy access to a to the ocean. Uh, definitely not. All right. So. Um, Simply, when we look at the spatial perspective, you're looking, you're looking at the where of why. You might have heard, surely you've heard your teacher say that a million times. Um, I'm, I'm no, I <laughs> just, I said totally backwards, guys. The, it's just in the why of where. Why is something where it is? That has to do with spatial perspective. Or in other words, how we use the space on Earth in order to meet the needs of human beings. And that right there is what we're looking at. Why is Kaliningrad separate from Russia? There's probably some political history to that. Uh, why is Lesotho within South Africa? We just talked about how that has a legacy in the apartheid era of South Africa's history. So there is always a, the why of where, the spatial perspective. And that right there is the important thing about what an enclave and exclave is, not when you use one word over the other. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. You are welcome, Josh Lopez. Um, different classification. All right, so now we're going we're gonna to take a little break. All right, we, we just looked at state morphology for what it is, the actual shapes of states. But there are other elements to state morphology or to understanding state relationships, such as the boundaries, that, you know, the areas on the outside of those states. And so what we're going to do is we're going to classify boundaries together real quick. Uh, and, and different classifications of boundaries, which go hand in hand with state morphology, uh, uh, water, mountains, and deserts are going to be, let me get this out of the way. Um, water, mountains, and deserts are going to be your um, major physical features that serve as boundaries or historically have really served as boundaries between lands. Okay? And it's really important to understand this. If you're looking at ancient civilizations, for example, like Sumer in the Indus Valley in Egypt, for Sumer, you've got you know, uh, not, not a whole lot of natural barriers. They're kind of out in the open, but you might have some deserts that might serve as natural barriers. A lot of people in Sumerian cities would have built walls because they lacked protection. But if you look at a place like the Indus Valley, they have the mountains to the north. They were completely isolated from people on the 
Kuang He uh, River Valley, the uh, the Yellow River Valley, in China because of the mountains. Uh, they also were isolated from other groups because of their geography as well. And Egypt, the only way you could get in there is from the north because of the fact that they had miles and miles and miles of desert on either the east or the west of that ancient civilization. So the entire civilization of Egypt was along the Nile River. So these are how some of the you know natural boundaries listed here would have served you know to, to protect these ancient civilizations. Today, water is still a boundary, right? I mean, you still have uh, uh, if you look at immigration into Europe. Uh, the Mediterranean is is a major. Um, <clears throat> that's where I'm looking for. Uh, uh, and when you say migration, it's it's going to be a um, intervening obstacle, right? It's going to be something that gets in the way of people traveling from one place to another because it's water. It's hard to get across. You can't just swim over an ocean. I don't care what year it is. Yeah, I mean, sea travel and air travel is cheaper and more accessible to everyone than ever before. But if you're an immigrant and you're poor and you're trying to, particularly a refugee is trying to get to a uh, a country to, to, to seek refuge, then water is going to be a major issue for you. Mountains are another are, are a major issue. Um, and, and deserts. So all these things are still issues today. Here's the example of the, this is here is the, um, where the Harappan uh, uh, River Valley would have been. The uh, Indus River Valley would have been right here. And you can see that the elevation is, is intense all around, but especially the Himalayan mountain range. Um, the, the largest mountain range on earth, you've got the, uh, the plateau of Tibet, Tibet right here. Um, very, very high elevation. And then here's where the Yellow River Valley would have been with ancient China. So there's not going to be a whole lot of interaction between those groups due to the natural boundaries. But that's not the only way that we characterize and classify boundaries in human geography. All right? There are actual classifications, and, and sometimes these might look different depending on which book you're reading. And, and uh, so there might be a few things in your textbook that don't show up here in my PowerPoint. But for the most part, this right here is going to cover your, your boundaries that you need to know about for the test. Um, and, and it looks like this. You've got antecedent boundaries. Subsequent boundaries, relic, and superimposed. And, and then there might be other classifications of, of those, but the, these are here are really important. And, and when you look at antecedent boundaries, they are simply boundaries that the lines between the two countries were drawn prior to um, the population of those countries. All right. So if you look at uh, the history of Canada, the United States, the boundary there on the north of the U.S. was set well before people started to develop those, uh, I guess, frontier lands further to the west along that boundary. Um, and and China, Canada's population is freakishly small compared to the United States. Uh, uh, but but still, the, the border was already known. This is the, the textbook example. It's, one of, it's the, the, probably the best example of an antecedent boundary. Uh, another historic example, perhaps the Treaty of Tauruseus. Anybody know what that is? The Treaty of Tauruseus? Not sure if you guys have had world history, not or not yet. And um, but during the age of exploration, the Treaty of Tordesillas was uh, was actually made between Spain and Portugal over who would get what portion of the New World, or really of the, of the world in general. Okay, so they uh, Spain got everything to the west of the treaty line, which went kind of right through Brazil, and Portugal got everything kind of to the east, including the areas along the African coast, which was kind of their big um, route to the uh, Spice Islands uh, that saved them so much money, or I guess made them so much money off of the other Europeans who want access to the spice trade. Um, subsequent boundaries are the, kind of the opposite of an antecedent boundary. The boundaries are going to be drawn after people arrive in those areas, and usually subsequent boundaries are created in order to divide people by ethnic, religious, or linguistic characteristics. All right, so there's a reason for that line. It exists in order to keep people apart from other people or maybe uh, maybe even be a border between different nationalities. All right? So a good, a good example of that, uh, perhaps uh, the European countries. Uh, I would say that the, 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 those people, uh, nationally speaking, are centered on different characteristics like language and culture and religion. Um, <laughs> hope you – sorry about my kids, y'all. <laughs> A uh, relic boundary is going to be an area that's no longer a border at all. The Great Wall of China, for example, that used to try to keep the barbarians out of the north. It, never, it was never a time that worked for them. But it was still a border that represented where 
the, or the Chinese people were and where the barbarians were. And I don't know if you guys ever noticed this, but the Great Wall of China is not along the modern-day northern border of China. It's actually quite further uh, to the south because, really, that's, that's what the Chinese empire was back in the day. Um, another example would be Hadrian's Wall. I wish I would have put a picture of the Roman Empire on here. I, I meant to do that. I did it a few weeks ago. But if you look at the island of Great Britain and the extent of the Roman Empire, you can see a line that separates what the Romans were able to control versus what they couldn't. They couldn't take from the Germanic people in the north. And so um, that would be an example of a, of, of, of a, of a relic boundary. That's Hadrian's Wall, um, named after the emperor that had it built. And then finally, superimposed boundaries are going to be boundaries that are placed on a group of people by a group outside. All right, so the perfect example of this is the entire continent of Africa. I've got a map. Finally, I actually remember to put one in. I've got a map that shows the ethnic boundaries of Africa. I don't have a map that shows the political boundaries of Africa, I don't think. Nope. But um, these, these lines that divide the thousands of ethnic groups, or I guess the um, probably close to, and by some counts, over a thousand ethnic groups that live in Africa, um, the political lines don't care about these ethnic groups. The political lines were, were created by imperial countries, the countries that dominated these areas during the age of imperialism. They're the ones that drew the lines uh, that exist today for these countries. You wonder why Africa is always such a hot mess uh, and why places like Sudan is fighting a civil war. This here is roughly where Sudan is. And, and northern Sudan is roughly going to be in this area here. I'm just kind of ballparking it. And then southern Sudan is going to be here. Well, look at all the ethnic diversity. They exist there. They're not going to get along. So they're going to fight civil wars for decades and decades and decades and never stop. It's because every group wants a, a, a chance to rule or to govern the affairs of everyone else. And that's what you get whenever you impose one government over thousands or, I guess, hundreds of different ethnic groups. So that's the example of a superimposed boundary. And to review, superimposed boundaries are going to be... <clears throat> Um, boundaries that were placed on a group by an outside force, like in this case, Europe during the Berlin Conference. <clears throat> All right. So um, I also want to talk a little bit about the characteristics of boundaries. Not all boundaries are friendly, right? I mean, obviously right now the big thing in the news in the U.S. is the southern border. Okay. You know, build a wall, right? Uh, government shut down. All that stuff is in our news right now. Uh, in relation to uh, uh, border issues. And, and so you, you've got all kinds of border issues that that, that could creep up. Um, in the case of North and South Korea, it's definitely one that you guys have probably already discussed in class, but it's, it's, it's one that's worth knowing a little more about um, because of the historic implications. And that is at the 38th parallel along the island, I guess along the peninsula of Korea, is the DMZ or the Demilitarized Zone. Now, and by that, I mean it's the most militarized zone on Earth. Okay, there is, there is it's, uh, uh, try to make a meme. Um, there's more, it's, it's a hotter border than any other border on the face of the planet. Okay, there's never going to be two uh, places there, I guess, more at arms with each other than that place right there. It's heavily guarded on both sides. Um, people have to be a certain height in order to be on at either end, you know, so you get their, their tallest, most intimidating looking, looking troops. Um, there's bar, uh, barbed, there's uh, electric fences, there's uh, landmines, uh, there's all kinds of shrapnel and things like that within the DMZ area, maybe roughly a mile uh, uh, between the two, the two sides. I know that the North Koreans will build elaborate cities on their end of the DMZ that make the South look like, hey, let's go over there because it's so awesome. Um, they have uh, all sorts of different uh, political disputes that, that I mean, it really is kind of the the um, a very tense area to be from what from what I've from what I've gathered. There is a room within this little um, area between the DMZ where each side has access, but they hardly ever will go and meet. I think recently, actually, they have probably met there uh, a few times more. In fact, honestly, in the last year, 2018 was kind of a big year for um, for the relationship between North and South. Uh, I want to say it was uh, when was it that? Yeah, that was. That was uh, wasn't it the, the the Winter Olympics was a year ago, right? If I remember right, and then the North and South actually competed together on an Olympic team. That's a big deal. Uh, uh, the issues with uh, uh, Trump having meetings with 
Kim Jong Un is, is is a big deal that hasn't happened before. And so, uh, whereas things with North Korea got a little bit um, crazy there for a little while, like really crazy, things have weirdly kind of been uh, pretty calm between between the two relative to to how it has been for years. Uh, not that they don't still do crazy things and, and that there's still a lot of, of tension, but but uh, it has gotten better. Here is a uh, video on my YouTube channel uh, where I talk about boundaries in a little bit greater detail. If you want more on this, I'm going to move on because I'm already 35 minutes in. I want to make sure I finish up in 45 to 50 minutes. But uh, feel free to go and look at this. If you t- type in boundaries, Professor Dustin, you will be able to see it. Um, and I cover all those different types of boundaries. Um. All right, so <clears throat> another form of boundary has to do with the law of the sea. And, and, and yeah, this isn't a tangible physical boundary. You can see like if you're standing between uh, two states. I don't know if you guys ever have that. For me, I live in South Carolina, so I've gone to Carowinds a few times, and I'm able to stand on the border of North Carolina and on the border of South Carolina. And that's cool, right? Let's take a selfie. Um, and so I don't know where you guys live, but you might have access to something similar to that. Well, the law of the sea isn't something you can kind of see or feel or touch. It isn't measured by a landmark, but by a certain amount of distance into the ocean, how much uh, a, a country is going to control off the coast, off of their off of their coast. Um, all right. So again, looking at landlocked countries, don't forget they don't have none of this applies to them. They have no coastal area that they get to control, and that's not fair, is it? But that's just the way it is. So, how close the country's border is, be- uh, how close to a country's border belongs to that country in the sea. That's that's a stupidly written question. But the the point I'm trying to make is that um, who gets to control the coast, the area right off the border of a country? Uh, there are four different classifications of the water, and and this is universally recognized by pretty much every country on earth. Uh, here's the way it works. Um, one, you've got ter- territorial sea, which is going to be like the, the, basically a country has sovereignty over territorial sea. And that is considered more or less the same as if you're on land. <clears throat> um, 12 nautical miles, that's not very far, from the, from the coast of that country is going to be controlled with sovereignty by, the, by that country. So, right, so the United States controls everything on the coast up to 12 nautical miles. If you are a uh, a Chinese warship, you don't want to go within that 12 miles. The contiguous zone is going to be twice the distance of the territorial sea. That's going to be the uh, 24 within 24 nautical miles. And this is where those countries get to enforce laws on customs. That means what can and cannot come into the country. Um, this is where, excuse me, this is where they deal with um, things like enforcing immigration. They can enforce, uh, Sanitation, what you're able to bring in, what you're able to, uh, uh, you know, what people are able to, I guess, dispose of within the coastal area. Uh, number three is going to be the exclusive economic zones. Now, you're looking at a much wider land, I guess, a much wider area of the sea now. 200 nautical miles from the coast is going to be the exclusive economic zone. This is where countries can determine what kinds of economic activities are going to happen off their coast, like fishing, um, exploring the sea. Uh, extracting resources and, and things like that. Okay. The high seas, everybody gets to ride. Okay. So, what that means is that you can't control something beyond 200 nautical miles of your, of your border. All right. Uh, it's just going to be the high seas and it's everyone's turf. Nobody can control that. All right. So, I, I, again, I, I missed the opportunity to put a really cool map on here, but actually, two really cool maps. But um, I'm not sure if y'all have heard or have researched at any point in the last several years uh, the issue with the South China Sea, right? So if you if you Google South China Sea news, it's probably a news article from within like a, a couple of days having to do with sovereignty issues over that whole region of the earth. And, and, and basically, you've got several countries. Actually, I do have a map that has that in it All right, right here. All right, so this is China. Here's the South China Sea. Okay, here's Taiwan. Here's the Philippines. Here's Vietnam. And uh, here's Malaysia. And there's other countries in here as well. And all these countries have borders, I guess, have coastal areas within the South China Sea. But guess what? 
Ladies and gentlemen, China is like, booyah, we've always uh, controlled and dominated this area since our inception. If you look back at exploration, we had the treasure fleets. We had um, the, the, the tribute system. Since the dawn of time, we, the Middle Kingdom, we have controlled the mess out of the South China Sea. And so we have sovereignty here. Well, that's not really fair, is it? Right? Because why about all these other? Well, first of all, Taiwan also claims all this area as their rightful uh, sovereign sea because Taiwan and China have the same history. So Taiwan's going to say, oh, it's all ours. And China's going to say, oh, you mean it's all ours, right? Um, but, they, but both of them are going to claim the whole thing. The Philippines, they want to be able to control the area of their economic exclusive zone. Um, Vietnam wants to control its economic exclusive zone. But you've got China in here doing all sorts of stuff to try to exert their political and economic force in that area. I, I, God, I, I missed another opportunity for a map. Um, there's maps that show trade routes, global trade routes. If you go and you Google global trade routes, you'll, you'll find maps that show the amount of shipping, uh, the amount of, of ships and containers that go within this area. You wonder why the United States wants to get involved. One of the big things that Barack Obama was doing in the last uh, maybe year and a half or so of his presidency is he wanted to pivot to China or pivot to Asia and kind of, uh, in, you know, in some in some in some ways you might say impose or he definitely wanted to exert his influence into this region here because look, a tremendous load of the commerce that comes to the shore of the United States goes through this area as well as places. You know, shipping will go into the Middle East and from here into Europe. Uh, shipping will go to uh, other parts of, of, of Europe around Africa or, or um, to the United States. So this, this area here is such an important area to control. And if China says, hey, by the way, we're all going to control this, um, we're going to build islands. They, they've literally been dredging out dirt to build islands where they have, will set up airstrips and, and military bases and things like this in the South China Sea so that they can say, we've got a foothold in this area, it's ours to control. So that's a major sovereignty point right now. We looked at sovereignty a few weeks ago, having to do with law to sea issues, okay? Um, another example of a law to sea issue would be the um, Arctic Circle, okay? There's a lot of, of uh, well, there's the Arctic Ocean, right? Well, you've got Canada, you've got Russia, you've got Scandinavian countries, these countries that have coastline that overlap with other countries' coasts. And so in some cases, there is conflict, conflict over who gets to control what area within the Arctic Ocean. Here is a visual that shows the, um, the different zones we're talking about. All right? so here is your territorial zone, your contiguous zone, your economic, your exclusive economic zone would be all this, really. And then this is the high seas where everyone is able to be in this part. This is a cool little visual. You can Google uh, law to see and click on images and find a lot of different um, examples of this. You don't need to know like great depth on this topic. I, I really don't think you do. On the surface, you need to be able to explain what it is, uh, why it's important. Give some, maybe some examples of, of uh, countries maybe or certain conflicts having to do with law to see. Uh, and you should, be, you should be set. All right. Any questions about anything? I got two questions. I missed them. Dang. Why do people choose? Why do people choose law to see rather than owning land? I'm not sure if I understand the question, Brianna. <clears throat> it has to do with um, uh, uh, I get uh, the international body collectively agrees with with the law to see because I think it's it's fair, right? I mean, no country wants to lose land or, or what they would consider a territory, um, so they agree on things and they stick to it. It's kind of like our definition of sovereignty from a few weeks ago. When you look at uh, a region like Catalonia wanting to break away from Spain, well, we don't recognize things like that because nobody wants Texas to break away from the U.S. and then Spain and the rest of Europe to accept Texas as a, as a sovereign nation. So I, I think maybe, hopefully I answered your question with that. I'm not exactly sure what you're asking, though. All right. So um, electoral geography, gerrymandering. Uh, uh, I put this here in this lecture having to do with uh, borders and boundaries because really it's very similar. Uh, uh, it's kind of in the same category, really. Um, in the United States, we have a federal system of government. So last week we spent a little bit of time looking at unitary and federal states. 
we are a federal uh, country, which means that we have a um, national government with a lot of strong central central power that handles certain responsibilities. But then our state governments are going to handle things on a state and local level because they want to represent population. Well, one of the things that characterizes our legislature is the fact that we have two houses within our Congress, all right, and that is the Senate and the House of Representatives. So a little bit of quick history. The Senate is going to, you know, people that wanted the Senate, uh, uh, they wanted every state to have equal representation, okay? Well, this right here historically would have benefited uh, states that didn't have as many people over states with a lot of people. But then the other side of the coin was they wanted representation based on population, which would have made it so that states like uh, uh, um, 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 Virginia is what I'm trying to think of, would have had a huge population at the time. Uh, it would have had a huge advantage in Congress. And so what we ended up agreeing with is that each state would get two House reps, just two on, on, the, on the surface, and then, I'm sorry, Senate reps, and then it would get House reps based on population that would also govern on a local level. So you look at your different congressional districts within your state, then you can see the areas that each representative is going to be representing. And they are voted in by the people of that particular area. Okay, so I say all that to say, politics, man. People always trying to take advantage and, and uh, always trying to get you know, their say, even sometimes to a point of cheating because, man, if you ain't cheating, you're not playing the game, right? No one's going to win if you, if you don't have to really work for it and cheat for it. I'm being sarcastic, but really gerrymandering is, is an example of, uh, of cheating if I ever saw it. All right, so here's the way it looks. This here is my state. I live in South Carolina. We have seven congressional districts, right? And this here is Maryland. And I know Maryland looks kind of small for you guys, but uh, you've got a bunch of crazy things happening. here. You can see the different colors represent different congressional districts. And what in the world is, is this? What in the world is district number three? Why, won't, why is it all, you know, snaked out like that and and, and uh i want to say it was maybe this district or one of the other one, one district in north carolina or something i mean every now and again you might have a most gerrymandered district on in, you know in the country where you can just look at it on the surface and say something about this isn't right all right what are they trying to do here uh by, by separating this congressional district in such a crazy way but when you look at a state like south carolina is is gerrymandering I mean, this here's a clear case, like you just now said, right? By the way, both parties do gerrymandering. It's not just a Republican or a Democrat thing. However, you can find evidence to support possibly that Republicans do it the most. Nevertheless, both parties still do it. Um, you can look here. I, I don't know the, the congressional uh, breakdown of Maryland. I'm assuming that the map is correct and that there are seven uh, congressional districts there are Democrat and one that's Republican. Uh I'm guessing that's right. I'm telling you straight up. I don't know. I haven't verified that. It's just a map. But if you look at um, South Carolina, is gerrymandering happening in South Carolina? Or could you make a case that these are gerrymandered districts? Well, on the surface, I mean, this looks elongated. But for the most part, the congressional districts in South Carolina look pretty good On you know, if you're just going by the map. They... They seem to be relatively compact. Uh, uh, there's possibly equal population. I'm guessing that they're going to be uh, equal populations. I, again, I haven't looked at the populations of the different congressional districts, but usually that's what they try to do. All right. But if you look a little bit deeper at the, at the at other maps and other types of data points for South Carolina, you get to see a different picture. First, look at the area, the percent below federal poverty level in South Carolina. You've got a bunch of poverty in this kind of center area going straight through the state, not a little bit further out from the coast, but going straight through more or less the center of the state. Well, you look a little bit further and you say that, you know, this here is almost entirely black in terms of your, I mean, your, your majority population is in some cases 60 or 70%. Okay. So even, even more than 50% in some of these different counties. All right. So, now, if you look at this and you look at the fact that, well, this area is also super poor and you start to may be able to connect the dots a little bit. Well, let's look at the map again. What do we see with District 6? And what do we see going on here with ethnic and, and, and uh, 
and economic uh, 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 stability in that region. Well, this here in South Carolina, we call this area the corridor of shame. All right, and and, and it's it's a or sometimes the I ninety five corridor. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I hope I'm right about that interstate. Uh, but but there's actually YouTube segments and things like this. Uh, President Obama in 2008 came and campaigned in this area because it is it kind of is the armpit of South Carolina. Um, and you could argue that it's it's not fair to the groups that live here. It's and, and when you look at District Six. Obviously, District 6 is Democrat, right? Um, now, uh, I want to say that, let me look. Uh, uh, this is not current. I think District 5 also, God, I might be mixed up. I think District 5 is also, no, District 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 1. I think it's District 1 is also, uh, um, <clears throat> has a, a Democrat in it now. This was in 2016. Hope I'm telling you that right. There, I know that there are two congressional districts in South Carolina that are now, Democrat, but you could argue that there's some gerrymandering going on here because uh, they they've got people that are all more or less like minded politically in one area. Uh, blacks tend to, to vote Democrat. Uh, uh, the rest of the state is uh, not as not as ethnically black, far less ethnically black according to this map, and vote Republican. So that's why I wanted you guys to see is that gerrymandering isn't always something that's super obvious. Whenever you're looking on the map, you can't just always eyeball it like you can in North Carolina or like you can in Maryland. But you have to look a little bit deeper at some of the statistics. We're going to talk about different types of gerrymandering. But first, I have a question. Uh, who makes the political dis uh, district maps? For example, if I tune into CNN, would the political district map be the same as the political district map on Fox? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, I know that you have different people within the different news agencies that, that create their maps based on statistics. Usually, man, I hope they're, they're, they're going to be similar. They might be slightly different, but um, I know that in the cases where I've looked at different media outlets, like for example, when you're looking at election maps or electoral maps, usually they're all going to report the same kind of stuff like during the heat of election because they might get called out by another uh, uh, news agency that might be wrong. Um, in terms of in case that's not what you're asking, in terms of the people that draw the congressional lines, that takes place every 10 years when the census is done. You see what the populations are going to be within your states. And then the congressional, I guess the, the party that is in control of the state legislature at that time will be the ones that are going to draw the, the lines between the borders. So if a Republican legislature is in control in 2020, Republicans are going to be the ones usually that get to draw the congressional lines, which again kind of shows, well, they've got a lot to, uh, to win by, by gerrymandering. And so it happens all the time. It's not something that is ancient history. And we talk about the first case of jury, or I guess the, the gerrymander political cartoon you guys study in maybe eighth grade or definitely going to look at in 11th grade. This stuff still happens. It happens all the time. Josh, I hope I answered your question, man. Um, all right, so here are some examples of gerrymandering. Uh, and, and, and there are, I think I've got, I've got them kind of classified into three different areas here, stacking, packing, and cracking. But the picture speaks volumes because you're able to actually see how it works. If you just look at the raw population, like in this map here, you're going to see that there is a majority green. So theoretically, green ought to win in elections and things all the time. Because there's more of them if you're going by popular vote. Um, in this particular picture here, uh, districts are compact and fair. And you see where uh, you know, you've got two purple districts that make up 40% of the population. And then three green districts make up 60% and green wins. But over here, districts may be compact and unfair. Now, this right here is going to kind of be like with South Carolina. These are compact, but you could argue... You could argue that it's maybe unfair. And the reason is because what you do is you end up packing, uh, and maybe this here is a better example for, for what I'm trying to show you, but you end up packing a lot of like-minded individuals into one district that they're they're going to win. But then there's so many people within that one particular district that there's not enough in other districts to make a difference in their elections. And so if you look here at this one, for example, th this here is almost entirely green. And so green's going to win this district. But by putting so many green people in this one area, 
and then spacing the others out where you got mostly purple, you can see that purple ends up winning even though they make up um, less of the population. That's how gerrymandering works. It is hard sometimes to look at it and say, well, that's gerrymandering. Oh my gosh, what are you thinking? Um, but it does happen all the time on both sides. To summarize this one real quick, because I need to get into political theories and I'm running out of time fast. Uh, you've got cracking, which is when you break apart a different group, like, uh, like, like, like um, so I'd say this, here's probably the best example of that. Look at you, where, like I said, you, you kind of break a group off like this. All right. Um, stacking or packing. Maybe that's a better example of packing. Um, packing is where you put all like-minded people into one or a few large groups like we see in South Carolina here. All right. South Carolina is never going to be a Democrat state. Uh, now, to be fair, also, they are mostly Republicans in South Carolina. Um, and then stacking is going to be when you dilute a minority group with the majority, which would be mostly probably this one right here. Okay, So there are a bunch of uh, uh, maybe a large minority in each congressional district, but it's uh, uh, you know they're completely, I guess, covered by the fact that there's a majority in every district. And so green is going to win 100 percent when it should probably only win uh, 60%. All right, so redistricting, This here's what I just now saying. I'm going to skip this slide, but what it's talking about is state legislatures are the ones that are going to be drawing the lines, and basically whoever's in charge is going to be the ones doing that. All right. Um, at the end of this PowerPoint, I have a really cool video resource that you guys can find on YouTube to help you understand more on gerrymandering, because I know I went through that pretty quick. Um, but the last thing I want to do is quickly cover these geopolitical models. And, and there's actually four of that now I'm just talking about. The organic rimland, heartland, and then I didn't put the domino theory, but the domino theory is like, I mean, it really makes sense. So the first one, and, and you, need to, you need to be familiar with the guy who, who creates these different theories as well. Ratzel's organic theory. Okay, so people start really looking in geography and really start looking at political, I guess, geopolitics in the 1800s. You start seeing where Russia, for example, um, during the Crimean War, one of the most important wars that's never discussed in world history courses. But in the Crimean War, Russia, for geopolitical purposes, basically starts to try to take on uh, the, the, the Ottoman Turks. They were weak as crap. Um, it ended up bad for Russia because not everyone sided with the Turks rather than side with Russia. But more or less, um, Ratzel's organic theory states that countries literally have a lifespan. They have a birth. They have a, a youth, a young, strong, vigorous, growing age. They have a, 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 a – like they get old and then they start to die. And, and, and this happens – it's all figurative, but this happens – according to whether or not a country is able to continue to take land. All right, so here's the problem with Ratzel's theory. In order for a country to grow, it has to literally expand its territory, okay, and, and eat, consume more land. Now, if you look at what Hitler was doing leading up to World War II, um, Ratzel is a German geopolitical theorist, okay? So it makes sense that Hitler's going to look at his work and say, oh, let's do this. And he starts trying to take area where German people live in order to grow Germany for the German people. Okay, it's classic example of the application of Ratzel's organic theory. The problem is, in order for countries to grow, according to this theory, they have to conquer other countries, which leads to geopolitical aggression. Nobody likes that, right? The second of these models we're going to look at and y'all if you gotta go go ahead and go i am going to keep on going until i'm done it might take me five or six minutes over um you know and y'all welcome to stay with me but uh halfred mckinder's heartland theory 1904 so at the very beginning of the 1900s you've got this guy talking about this area called a heartland or a pivot area within a, a large continent of eurasia which he controlled he called the world island Okay, I'm going to show you a map in a second. But um, tons of resources in, ag in agriculture would have existed within the heartland area. Okay, so, so whoever controls the heartland controls the world because of access to types of mineral resources, all sorts of resources, um, agriculture, a lot of food. Here's the quote from McKinder's writings. Who, control, who rules Eastern Europe commands the heartland? Who rules the heartland and commands the world island? Who rules the world island controls the world? It's literally a plan for world domination, like, like a, a, a Dr. Evil and all that. You know, how cool is that? Here's a map of it. This, this 
whole area is the world island. This is Eurasia. The pivot area is the area kind of where modern-day Russia is. And then you've got this area on the um, outside, which is usually called the, the rim land, in this case, the inner or marginal crescent. Okay, And then you get everything else on the outside. So whoever controls the pivot area would have the power due to its surplus of resources to control everything on the outside of the world on. And if you control all this, according to McKendra and the Heartland Theory, you control the world, baby. Woo! All right. So <clears throat> this became a problem for people like in the United States and the West during the Cold War. We didn't like to hear that that uh, Joseph Stalin Soviet Union, which was basically, you know, controlled the, the heartland, all right? We didn't like to hear about how he's going to dominate the world. That sucked. So we start looking at another geopolitical theorist named Spikeman. And, and Spikeman um, creates what we call the Rimland Theory in 1942. So right at the end of World War II, just before the Cold War era, um, it, it was a contrasting philosophy to the heartland theory. In contrast to Heartland Theory, according to the Heartland Theory, the Soviets are empowered to control the world because of their domination of the Heartland. But, 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 the Rimland Theory states that the control of the Rimland can prevent world domination from the Heartland. So wait a second. There is a weakness. So according, again, to the Rimland Theory, if you control this, you can cut off he who controls the heartland. You guys ever heard of the policy of containment? Because that's what you're listening to. All right. So when you have uh, uh, the the first, the blue is the first world. We talked about this a few weeks ago. The, the, the green is the third world. Hashtag third world problems, right? But usually we don't hear about the second world. That's because the second world doesn't exist anymore. It was the Soviets and their allies. So, so here is the cutoff between NATO, NATO, and the Warsaw Pact, right here in Eastern Europe. This is the Iron Curtain, y'all. This is the border that uh, Churchill called Iron Curtain, and we started a policy of containment where we literally wanted to control the Rimland and prevent the expansion of the Soviet communist, uh, uh, you know, uh, communism into these Rimland countries. And so this is the justification for the proxy wars that we fought in Vietnam and Korea and Afghanistan and Cuba and so on and so forth, all right? Because that right, that right there, we just now looked at, this is the policy of containment. That's, that's what we got from Spikeman's Rimland Theory. All right, finally, the last one I wanted to talk about is the domino theory. And this, again, is a Cold War, um, um, a Cold War mentality. Uh, what we kind of thought as the United States is if we lose one country to communism, the other countries nearby are going to fall to communism as well. So, so if we lose Vietnam, Korea is going to fall. If we lose Korea, Afghanistan is going to fall. If we lose so on and so forth, right? That's the domino theory. That's the reason why I told you it makes a lot of sense, really. And there's not a whole lot more to say than that. Uh, that really is a summary of, of the domino theory. I got a little picture of dominoes here. So we ran a little bit over. I, I do have one. I, I'm going to show you guys a slide that's got some resources on it. But here's a quick summary of what we talked about. You guys can read it. It's the same thing we just talked about. And here are some of the resources. The borders video that uh, I guess the boundaries video that I had. If you Google, like I said, boundaries, Professor Dustin, you'll find that. Geopolitical models. Um, this is a video by a um, geography teacher named Caroline Bednars. Uh, she has a very good YouTube channel. Uh, her her videos are very long, but very, very detailed. Uh, so so if you ever really want some good studying right there, that's a, a place I would start. And she talks in, in great detail about the different geopolitical models if you want a refresher on that. And then also the gerrymandering video is right here. Um, there is a bunch of those. Um, any questions for me before I sign off? Tell your friends about this. If it's helpful for you, and you think that might be helpful for them, or even if your teacher wants to come in, I don't care. I think that'd be great to have more teachers on. Thank you for the webinar. It really helped a lot. You are welcome, Josh Lopez. Tell your friends about me. And uh, if there are no other questions, I'll catch you guys on the internet.